Disc 28, The Amazing Maurice and His Educated Rodents By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 3x12 He raised his voice. Squad Quad What does the first mouse get? The roar of voices made dust fall down from the ceiling. The trap. And don't you forget it, said Darkton. Take him out, special offer. I'll be with you in a minute. A younger rat stepped forward, and faced the squads. Let's go, rats. Hut, hut, hut. The trap squads trotted away. Darkton walked over to Dangerous Beans. That's got us started, he said. If we can't get the humans looking for a good rat catcher by tomorrow, we don't know our business. We need to stay longer than that, said Peaches. Some of the ladies are going to have their babies. I said we don't know it's safe here yet, said Darkton. Do you want to be the one to tell Big Savings, said Peaches, sweetly. Big Savings was the old head female, widely agreed to have a bite like a pickaxe and muscles like rock. She also had a short temper with males. Even ham pork kept out of her way when she was in a bad mood. Nature has to take its course, obviously, said Darkton, quickly. But we haven't explored. There must be other rats here. Oh, the Kikis all keep out of the way of us said Peaches. That was true, Darkton had to agree. Ordinary rats did keep out of the way of the changelings. Oh, there was some trouble sometimes, but the changelings were big and healthy and could think their way through a fight. Dangerous Beans was unhappy about this but, as Ham Pork said, it was either us or them and when you got right down to it, it was a rat-eat-rat world. I'm going to go and join my squad said Darkton, still unnerved at the thought of confronting Big Savings. He moved closer. What's up with ham pork? He's, thinking about things, said Peaches. Thinking, said Darkton, blankly. Oh. Right. Well, I've got traps to see to. Smell you later. What is the matter with ham pork? said Dangerous Beans, when he and Peaches were alone again. He's getting old, said Peaches. He needs to rest a lot. And I think he's worried that Darkton or one of the others is going to challenge him. Will they, do you think? Darkton's more wrapped up in breaking traps and testing poisons. There's more interesting things to do now than bite one another. Or do RLLK, from what I hear said Dangerous Beans. Peaches looked down, demurely. If rats could blush, she would have done. It was amazing how pink eyes that could hardly see you could look straight through you at the same time. The ladies are a lot more choosy, she said. They want to find fathers who can think. Good, said Dangerous Beans. We must be careful. We don't need to breed like rats. We don't have to rely on numbers. We are the changelings. Peaches watched him anxiously. When Dangerous Beans was thinking, he seemed to be staring into a world only he could see. What is it this time? she asked. I have been thinking that we shouldn't kill other rats. No rat should kill another rat. Even Kiki's, she queried. They are rats too. Peaches shrugged. Well, we've tried talking to them and that didn't work. Anyway, they mostly stay away these days. Dangerous Beans was still staring at the unseen world. Even so, he said quietly, I should like you to write it down. Peaches sighed, but went off anyway to one of the packs the rats had carried in and pulled out her bag. It was no more than a roll of cloth with a handle made from a scrap of string but it was big enough to hold a few matches, some pieces of pencil lead, a tiny sliver of a broken knife blade for sharpening the leads, and a grubby piece of paper. All the important things. She was also the official carrier of Mr. Bunsey. K. 
carrier wasn't quite correct, Dragger was mostly more accurate. But Dangerous Beans always liked to know where it was and seemed to think better when it was around, and it gave him some comfort, and that was good enough for Peaches. She smoothed out the paper on an ancient brick, picked up a piece of lead and looked down the list. The first thought had been. In the clan is strength. This had been quite a hard one to translate, but she had made an effort. Most rats couldn't read human. It was just too hard to make the lines and squiggles turn into any sense. So Peaches had worked very hard on making a language that rats could read. She'd tried to draw a big rat made up of little rats. The writing had led to trouble with ham pork. New ideas needed a running jump to get into the old rat's head. Dangerous Beans had explained in his strange calm voice that writing things down would mean that a rat's knowledge would go on existing even when the rat had died. He said that all the rats could learn the knowledge of ham pork. Ham pork had said. Not likely. It had taken him years to learn some of the tricks he'd learned. Why should he give it all away? That'd mean any young rat would know as much as him. Dangerous Beans had said. We see you operate, or we die. That had become the next thought. CO operate had been difficult, but even Kiki's would sometimes lead a blind or wounded comrade, and that was certainly cooperation. The thick line, where she'd pressed heavily, had to mean no. The trap sign could mean die or bat or avoid. The last thought on the paper was. Not to whittle where you eat. That one was quite simple. She grasped the piece of lead in both paws and carefully drew. No rat to kill another rat. She sat back. Yes, not bad, trap was a good sign for death, and she'd added the dead rat to make it all more serious. But supposing you have to, she said, still staring at the drawings. Then you have to, said Dangerous Beans. But you shouldn't. Peaches shook her head sadly. She supported Dangerous Beans because there was, well, something about him. He wasn't big or fast and he was almost blind and quite weak and sometimes he forgot to eat because he came up with thoughts that nobody at least, nobody who was a rat had thought before. Most of them had annoyed ham pork no end, like the time when Dangerous Beans had said, what is a rat, and ham pork had replied, teeth. Claws. Tail. Run. Hide. Eat. That's what a rat is. Dangerous Beans had said, but now we can also say what is a rat. He said. And that means we're more than that. We're rats, Ham Pork had argued. We run around and squeak and steal and make more rats. That's what we're made for. Who buy? Dangerous Beans had said, and that had led to another argument about the big rat deep under the ground theory. But even ham pork followed Dangerous Beans, and so did rats like Darkton and Donut enter, and they listened when he talked. Peaches listened when they talked. We were given noses, Darkton had told the squads. Who had given them noses? The thoughts of Dangerous Beans worked their ways into other people's heads without them noticing. He came up with new ways of thinking. He came up with new words. He came up with ways of understanding the things that were happening to them. Big rats, rats with scars, listened to the little rat because the change had led them into dark territory and he seemed to be the only one with an idea of where they were going. She left him sitting by the candle and went and looked for ham pork. He was sitting by a wall. Like most of the old rats he always stuck close to walls, and kept away from open spaces and too much light. He seemed to be shaking. Are you all right, she said. The shaking stopped. Fine, fine, nothing wrong with me, snapped ham pork. Just a few twinges, nothing permanent. Only I noticed you didn't go out with any of the squads, said Peaches. There's nothing wrong with me, shouted the old rat. 
we've still got some potatoes in the baggage I don't want any food. There is nothing wrong with me, which meant that there was. It was the reason he didn't want to share all the things he knew. What he knew was all he had left. Peaches knew what rats traditionally did to leaders who were too old. She'd watched Hamburg's face when Darkton younger, stronger Darkton had been talking to his squads, and knew that Ham Pork was thinking about it, too. Oh, he was fine when people were watching him, but lately he'd been resting more, and skulking in corners. Old rats were driven out, to lurk around by themselves and go rotten and funny in the head. Soon there would be another leader. Peaches wished she could make him understand one of the thoughts of dangerous beans, but the old rat didn't much like talking to females. He'd grown up thinking females weren't for talking to. The thought was. It meant. We are the changelings. We are not like other rats. Chapter 4 The important thing about adventures, thought Mr. Bunsey, was that they shouldn't be so long as to make you miss mealtimes. From Mr. Bunsey has an adventure the kid and the girl and Maurice were in a large kitchen. The kid could tell it was a kitchen because of the huge black iron range in the chimney breast and the pans hanging on the walls and the long scarred table. What it didn't seem to have was what a kitchen traditionally had, which was food. The girl went to a metal box in the corner and fumbled round her neck for a string which, it turned out, held a large key. You can't trust anybody, she said. And the rats steal a hundred times what they eat, the devils. I don't think they do, said the kid. Ten times, at most. You know all about rats all of a sudden, said the girl, unlocking the metal case. Not all of a sudden, I learned it when now. That really hurt. Sorry about that, said Maurice. I accidentally scratched you, did I? He tried to make a face which said don't be a complete twerp, okay? Which is quite hard to do with a cat's head. The girl gave him a suspicious look, and then turned back to the metal box. There's some milk that's not gone hard yet and a couple of fish heads, she said, peering inside. Sounds good to me, said Maurice. What about your human? Him. He'll eat any old scraps. There's bread and sausage, said the girl, taking a kin from the metal cupboard. We're all very suspicious about the sausages. There's a tiny bit of cheese, too but it's rather ancestral. I don't think we should eat your food if it's so short, said the kid. We have got money. Oh, my father says it'd reflect very badly on the town if we weren't hospitable. He's the mayor, you know. He's the government, said the kid. The girl stared at him. I suppose so, she said. Funny way of putting it. The town council makes the laws, really. He just runs the place and argues with everyone. And he says we shouldn't have any more rations than other people, to show solidarity in these difficult times. It was bad enough that tourists stopped visiting our hot baths, but the rats have made it a lot worse. She took a couple of saucers from the big kitchen dresser. My father says that if we're all sensible there will be enough to go around she went on. Which I think is very commendable. I entirely agree. But I think that once you've shown solidarity, you should be allowed just a little extra. In fact, I think we get a bit less than everyone else. Can you imagine? Anyway, so you really are a magical cat, then, she finished, pouring the milk into a saucer. It oozed rather than gushed, but Maurice was a street cat and would drink milk so rotten that it would try to crawl away. Oh, yes, that's right, magical, he said, with a yellow-white ring around his mouth. For two fish heads he'd be anything for anybody. Probably belonged to a witch, I expect, with a name like Griselda or one of those names, said the girl, putting the fish heads on another saucer. Yeah, right 
Griselda, right, said Maurice, not raising his head. Who lived in a gingerbread cottage in the forest, probably. Yeah, right, said Maurice. And then, because he wouldn't be Maurice if he couldn't be a bit inventive, he added. Only it was a crisp bread cottage, cause she was slimming. Very healthy witch, Griselda. The girl looked puzzled for a moment. That's not how it should go, she said. Sorry, I tell a lie, it was gingerbread really, said Maurice quickly. Someone giving you food was always correct. And she had big warts, I'm sure. Miss, said Maurice, trying to look sincere, some of those warts had so much personality they used to have friends of their own. E.R., what's your name, miss? Promise not to laugh. All right. After all, there might be more fish heads. It's... Militia. Oh. Are you laughing, she said, in a threatening voice. No, said Maurice, mystified. Why should I? You don't think it's a funny name. Maurice thought about the names he knew Hamburg, Dangerous Beans, Darkton, Sardines. Sounds like an ordinary kind of name to me, he said. Militia gave him another suspicious look but turned her attention to the kid, who was sitting with the usual happy, faraway smile he wore when he didn't have anything else to do. And have you got a name, she said. You're not the third and youngest son of a king, are you? If your name starts Prince that's a definite clue. The kid said, I think it's Keith. You never said you had a name, said Maurice. No one ever asked before said the kid. Keith is not a promising name start, said Militia. It doesn't hint of mystery. It just hints of Keith. Are you sure it's your real name? It's just the one they gave me. Ah, that's more like it. A slight hint of mystery, said Militia, suddenly looking interested. Just enough to up suspense. You were stolen away at birth. I expect. You probably are the rightful king of some country, but they found someone who looked like you and did a swap. In that case, you'll have a magic sword, only it won't look magic, you see, until it's time for you to manifest your destiny. You were probably found on a doorstep. I was, yes, said Keith. See. I'm always right. Maurice was always on the lookout for what people wanted. And what Militia wanted, he felt, was a gag. But he'd never heard the stupid-looking kid talk about himself before. What were you doing on a doorstep, he said. I don't know. Gurgling, I expect, said Keith. You never said, said Maurice, accusingly. Is it important, said Keith. There was a magic sword or a crown in the basket with you, probably. And you've got a mysterious tattoo or a strange shaped birthmark, too, said Militia. I don't think so. No one ever mentioned them, said Keith. There was just me and a blanket. And a note. A note. But that's important. It said 19 pints and a strawberry yogurt, said Keith. Ah. Not helpful, then, said Militia. Why nineteen pints of milk? It was the Guild of Musicians, said Keith. Quite a large place. I don't know about the strawberry yogurt. Abandoned orphan is good, said Militia. After all, a prince can only grow up to be a king but a mysterious orphan could be anybody. Were you beaten and starved and locked in a cellar? I don't think so, said Keith, giving her a funny look. Everyone at the guild was very kind. They were mostly nice people. They taught me a lot we've got guilds here, said Militia. They teach boys to be carpenters and stonemasons and things like that. The guild taught me music, 
said Keith. I'm a musician. I'm good at it, too. I've been earning my own living since I was six. Aha! Uh -huh. Mysterious orphan, strange talent, distressed upbringing, it's all shaping up, said Militia. The strawberry yogurt is probably not important. Would your life have been different if it had been banana flavored? Who can say? What kinds of music do you play? Kinds. There aren't any kinds. There's just music, said Keith. There's always music, if you listen. Militia looked at Maurice. Is he always like this, she demanded. This is the most I've ever heard him say, said the cat. I expect you're very keen to know all about me, said Militia. I expect you're just too polite to ask. Gosh, yes, said Maurice. Well, you probably won't be surprised to know that I've got two dreadful stepsisters, said Militia. And I have to do all the chores. Gosh, really, said Maurice, wondering if there were any more fish heads and, if there were any more fish heads, whether they were worth all this. Well, most of the chores, said Militia as if revealing an unfortunate fact. Some of them, definitely. I have to clean up my own room, you know. And it's extremely untidy. Gosh, really. And it's very nearly the smallest bedroom. There are practically no cupboards and I'm running out of bookshelf space. Gosh, really. And people are incredibly cruel to me. You will note that we're here in a kitchen. And I'm the mayor's daughter. Should the daughter of a mayor be expected to wash up at least once a week? I think not. Gosh, really. And will you just look at these torn and bedraggled clothes I have to wear? Maurice looked. He wasn't good on clothes. Fur was enough for him. As far as he could tell. Malicia's dress was pretty much like any other dress. It seemed to be all there. There weren't any holes, except where the arms and head poked through. Here, just here, said Malicia, pointing to a place on the hem which, to Maurice, looked no different from the rest of the dress. I had to sew that back myself, you know. Gosh, re Maurice stopped. From here he could see the bare shelves. More importantly, he could see sardines obsiling down from a crack in the ancient ceiling. He had a knapsack on his back. And on top of this I'm the one who has to queue for the bread and sausages every day Militia continued, but Maurice was listening even less than he had been before. It had to be sardines, he thought. Idiot. He always goes ahead of the trap squad. Of all the kitchens in all the town he could turn up in, he's turned up in this one. Any minute she's going to turn round and scream. Sardines would probably treat it as applause, too. He lived life as if it was a performance. Other rats just ran around squeaking and messing up things, and that was quite good enough to convince humans there was a plague. But, oh, no, sardines always had to go further. Sardines and his yodel song and dance act. And the rats take everything, Militia was saying. What they don't take, they spoil. It's been terrible. The council have been buying in food from other towns, but no one has very much to spare. We have to buy corn and stuff from the traders that sail up the river. That's why bread is so expensive. Expensive, eh, said Maurice. We've tried traps and dogs and cats and poison and still the rats keep coming, said the girl. They've learned to be really sneaky, too. They hardly ever end up in our traps anymore. Hey. I only ever got five zero p for one tail. What's the good of the rat catchers offering us five zero p a tail if the rats are so cunning? The rat catchers have to use all kinds of tricks to get them, they say. Behind her, 
Sardines looked carefully around the room and then signaled to the rats in the ceiling to pull the rope up. Don't you think this would be a good time to go away, said Maurice. Why are you making faces like that, said Militia, staring at him. Oh, well, you know that kind of cat that grins all time? Heard of that? Well, I'm the kind that makes, you know, weird faces, said Maurice desperately. And sometimes I just burst out and say things get away get away, see, I did it again. It is an affliction. I probably need counseling oh no don't do that this is not the time to do that whoops, there I go again. Sardines had pulled his straw hat out of his knapsack. He was holding a small walking stick. It was a good routine, even Maurice had to admit. Some towns had advertised for a rat piper the very first time he'd done it. People could tolerate rats in the cream, and rats in the roof, and rats in the teapot, but they drew the line at tap danking. If you saw tap dancing rats, you were in big trouble. Maurice had reckoned that if only the rats could play an accordion as well they could do two towns a day. He'd stared for too long. Militia turned and her mouth opened in shock and horror as sardines went into his routine. The cat saw her hand reach out for a pan that was on the table. She threw it, very accurately. But sardines was a good pot dodger. The rats were used to having things thrown at them. He was already running when the pan was halfway across the room, and then he leapt onto the chair and then he jumped onto the floor and then he dodged behind the dresser and then there was a sharp, final, metallic, snap. Ha, said Militia and Maurice and Keith stared at the dresser. That's one rat less, at any rate. I really hate them. It was sardines, said Keith. No. It was definitely a rat, said Militia. Sardines hardly ever invade a kitchen. I expect you're thinking about the plague of lobsters over in he just called himself Sardines because he saw the name on a rusty old tin and thought it sounded stylish, said Maurice. He wondered if he dared look behind the dresser. He was a good rat, said Keith. He used to steal books for me when they were teaching me to read. Excuse me, are you mad, said Militia. It was a rat. The only good rat is a dead rat. Hello, said a little voice. It came from behind the dresser. It can't be alive. It's a huge trap, said Militia. It's got teeth. Anyone there? Only the stick is bending, said the voice. The dresser was massive the wood so old that time had turned it black and it had become as solid and heavy as stone. That's not a rat talking, is it, said Militia. Please tell me rats can't talk. In fact it's bending quite a bit now, said the voice, which was slightly muffled. Maurice squinted into the space behind the dresser. I can see him, he said. He wedged the stick in the jaws as they closed. Watcha, Sardines, how are you doing? Fine, boss, said Sardines, in the gloom. If it wasn't for this trap I'd say everything was perfect. Did I mention the stick is bending? Yes, you said. It's bent some more since then, boss. Keith grabbed one end of the dresser and grunted as he tried to move it. It's like a rock, he said. It's full of crockery, said Militia, now quite bewildered. But rats don't really talk, do they? Get out of the way, shouted Keith. He grabbed the back edge of the dresser with both hands, and braced one foot against the wall, and heaved. Slowly, like a mighty forest tree, the dresser pitched forward. The crockery started to fall out as it tipped plate slipping off plate like one glorious chaotic deal from a very expensive pack of cards. Even so, some of them survived the fall onto the floor, and so did some of the cups and saucers as the cupboard opened and added to the fun, but that didn't make any difference because then the huge, 
heavy woodwork thundered down on top of them. One miraculously whole plate rolled past Keith, spinning round and round and getting lower on the floor with the groy i woi oi yo oink sound you always get in these distressing circumstances. Keith reached down to the trap and grabbed sardines. As he pulled the rat up the stick gave way and the trap snapped shut. A bit of the stick spun away through the air. Are you all right? Keith asked. Well, boss, all I can say is it's a good job rats don't wear underwear. Thanks, boss, said Sardines. He was quite plump for a rat, but when his feet were dancing he could float across the floor like a balloon. There was the sound of a tapping foot. Militia, with arms folded and an expression like a thunderstorm, looked at Sardines, and then at Maurice, and then at the stupid-looking Keith, and then at the wreckage on the floor. E.R., sorry about the mess, said Keith. But he was she waved this away. Okay, she said, as if she'd been thinking deeply. It goes like this, I think. The rat is a magical rat. I bet he's not the only one. Something happened to him, or them, and now they're really quite intelligent, despite the tap dancing. And, they're friends with the cat. So, why would rats and a cat be friends? And it goes, there's some kind of an arrangement, right? I know. Don't tell me, don't tell me. Hey, said Keith. I shouldn't think anyone ever has to tell you anything, said Maurice. It's something to do with plagues of rats, right? All those towns we've heard about, well, you heard about them too, and so you got together with thingy here Keith, said Keith. Yes, and so you go from town to town pretending to be a plague of rats, and thingy Keith. Yes, pretends to be a rat piper and you all follow him out. Right? It's all a big swindle, yes. Sardines looked up at Maurice. She's got us bang to rights, boss, he said. So now you've got to give me a good reason why I don't call the watch out on you, said Militia triumphantly. I don't have to, Maurice thought, because you won't. Gosh, humans are so easy. He rubbed up against Militia's legs and gave her a smirk. If you do, You'll never find out how the story ends, he said. Ah, it'll end with you going to prison, said Militia, but Maurice saw her staring at the stupid-looking Keith and at Sardines. Sardines still had his little straw hat on. When it comes to attracting attention, that sort of thing counts for a lot. When he saw her frowning at him Sardines hastily removed his straw hat and held it in front of him, by the brim. There's something I'd like to find out, boss, he said, if we're finding out things. Militia raised an eyebrow. Well, she said. And don't call me boss. I'd like to find out why there's no rats in this city, G.U.V., said Sardines. He tap-danced a few steps, nervously. Militia could glare better than a cat. What do you mean, no rats? she said. There's a plague of rats. And you're a rat, anyway. There's rat runs all over the place and there's a few dead rats but we haven't found a living rat anywhere, G.U.V. Militia leaned down. But you are a rat, she said. Yes, G.U.V. But we only arrived this morning. Sardines grinned nervously as Militia gave him another long stare. Would you like some cheese, she said. I'm afraid it's only mousetrap. I don't think so, thank you very much all the same, said Sardines, very carefully and politely. It's no use, I think it really is time to tell the truth, said Keith. No 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 no, said Maurice, who hated that kind of thing. It's all because you were right, miss, said Keith wearily. We go from town to town with a bunch of rats and fool people into giving us money to leave. That's what we do. 
I'm sorry we've been doing it. This was going to be the last time. I'm very sorry. You shared your food with us and you haven't got much, either. We ought to be ashamed. It seemed to Maurice, while he was watching Militia make up her mind, that her mind worked in a different way to other people's minds. She understood all the hard things without even thinking. Magical rats? Yeah, yeah. Talking cats? Been there, done that, bought the singlet. It was the simple things that were hard. Her lips were moving. She was, Maurice realized, making up a story out of it. So. She said, you come along with your trained rats we prefer educated rodents, G.U.V., said Sardines. All right, you're educated rodents, and you move into a city, and, what happens to the rats that are there already? Sardines looked helplessly at Maurice. Maurice nodded at him to keep on. They were all going to be in big trouble if Militia didn't make up a story she liked. They keep out of our way, boss, I mean G.U.V., said Sardines. Can they talk too? No, G.U.V. I think the clan think of them as a bit like monkeys, said Keith. I was talking to Sardines, said Militia. Sorry, said Keith. And there are no other rats here at all. Militia went on. No, G.U.V. A few old skeletons and some piles of poisons and lots of traps, boss. But no rats, boss. But the rat catchers nail up a load of rat tails every day. I speak as I find, boss. G.U.V. No rats, boss. G.U.V. No other rats anywhere we've been, boss G.U.V. Have you ever looked at the rat tails, miss? said Maurice. What do you mean, said Militia. They're fake, said Maurice. Some of them, anyway. They're just old leather boot laces. I saw some in the street. They weren't real tails, said Keith. I'm a cat. You think I don't know what rats' tails look like? Surely people would notice, said Militia. Yeah said Maurice. Do you know what an aglet is? Aglet. Aglet? What's an aglet got to do with anything, snapped Militia. It's those little metal bits on the end of shoelaces, said Maurice. How come a cat knows a word like that, said the girl. Everyone's got to know something, said Maurice. Have you ever looked closely at the rat tails? Of course not. You can get the plague from rats, said Militia. That's right, your legs explode, said Maurice, grinning. That's why you didn't see the aglets. Your leg exploded lately, Sardines. Not today, boss, said Sardines. Mind you, it's not even lunchtime yet. Militia looked pleased. Aha! she said, and it seemed to Maurice that the ha had a very nasty edge to it. So, you're not going to tell the watch about us, he ventured, hopefully. What, that I've been talking to a rat and a cat, said Militia. Of course not. They'll tell my father I've been telling stories and I'll get locked out of my room again. You get locked out of your room as a punishment, said Maurice. Yes. It means I can't get at my books. I'm rather a special person, as you may have guessed, said Militia, proudly. Haven't you heard of the sisters Grimm? Agoniza and Evie Sarah Grimm? They were my grandmother and my great aunt. They wrote, fairy tales. Ah, so we're temporarily out of trouble here, thought Maurice. Best to keep her talking. I'm not a big reader, as cats go, he said. So what were these, then? Stories about little people with wings going tinkle tinkle. No, said Militia. 
they were not big on tinkling little people. They wrote, real fairy tales. Ones with lots of blood and bones and bats and rats in. I've inherited the storytelling talent, she added. I kind of thought you had, said Maurice. And if there's no rats under the town but the rat catchers are nailing up boot laces, I smell a rat, said Militia. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.